going to be a man of my word. Last week we said we're going to get a little deeper in this conversation where Jesus says um, that really it's significant that we love everybody, including the people that have hurt us. So uh, if you weren't here last week, I'll kind of unpack a little bit of what we talked about. So um, Jesus is walking out his ministry on the earth and he's asked a question by a very religious scholar and he tries to trap him in this question um, of all of the laws of the old covenant that practice with the, the people of Israel, the, the Israelites. He says, of all of the laws of the old covenant, which is the most important? And Jesus answers, uh, John chapter 13 and verse 34. Jesus responds, to, this is what he says. This is what he says. He says, love God with all you got. And the second one is just like it. it. Both of these, every law in the old covenant hinge on these two commands. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then later, sorry, I said John 13. We'll, we'll back up. John 13, 35. So Jesus then later sits with his disciples and he gives this, this elaborate conversation about what's to happen. This is what's going down. This is how things are going to take place. And, and as he spills to his disciples, he's like, listen, now I want to I do something new. I want to show you something new. John, this is what we'll pick up. John 13, 34. And 35, Jesus says, so now I'm giving you a new command. He says, this was the old covenant. This is the old commandments. Then here's the two greatest commandments that summarize it. All of, all of the old covenant hinge upon. Now here's this new command I give to you. He says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, if you remember the story before that, before Jesus gives this new covenant, he actually has a whole lot more that takes place in this, in this sit down, in this gathering, in this Passover dinner. But Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And there's 12 guys sitting in the room with him. And they're all, the 11 are looking around like, who's it going to be? And John even asked Jesus, Lord, who is it going to be? Like, who is the one? Who is it, Lord? Verse 26. So Jesus responds to the question. It's the one to whom I give the bread and dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. But check this out, verse 28. But none of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was the treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or maybe to give some money to the poor. So if you were here last week, so we said, Jesus tells his disciples, the 12 closest guys he sat with for the final time, they'd all be gathered together. One of you in this room is going to betray me. We didn't read this last week. Then he takes it a step farther. It's him. It's this guy. It's the guy I'm going to dip some bread and give it to. Here you go, Judas. Go do what you need to do. And the other 11 were like, who's it going to be? Who who do you think it is, guy? And then Judas gets up and leaves. And they couldn't figure it out. We said this last week. Why do you think it is that they had no idea that the other 11 had no idea who it was? Could it be because the other 11 could not tell that Jesus loved Judas any differently? And then Jesus gives this new commandment that he fulfills in this very same moment. Love people the way that I have loved you. He knew. I mean, he he called him out. He dips the bread and hands it to Judas. You are betraying me now. And yet the other disciples are like, I don't know who it is. How how are we going to tell who it is? How would we know? Why? Because love wasn't just the behavior of Jesus. It was his being. He is love. So when he goes as far as to say, a new commandment I'm giving you to love each other just as I have loved you. This, this new commandment, this new covenant that Jesus began, this new commandment is much less complicated than the old covenant. It's much less complicated than the 613 laws of the Old Testament. This new, this new commandment is, is, is much more demanding. If it's in your notes, if you're taking notes, the new commandment is much less complicated and much more demanding. And I would even argue maybe more demanding now than in some levels when John first wrote it. See, we live in this world, we live in a time, we live in a culture where there's this huge misunderstanding and huge misconception about love that would tell you that if you're going to love someone, you have to approve of every one of their behaviors. That if you're going to love someone, you have to be uh, approving of of how they act and how they talk and what they do. And and in fact, quite the opposite is true. If, If I don't approve of how someone behaves, well, then I'm hateful and I'm intolerant and I just am hostile to them. Can I just offer this truth? And maybe we settle on this and maybe this is the whole reason you came here today. It is possible. And I think Jesus models it so well to love someone and not approve of everything that they do. And if you're a parent, you know this. If you remember living with your parents, you know this. You probably have some rules in your house. We have some rules in our house. They're pretty simple. Be honest. Treat your mom with respect. And my kids, I love them. But when they don't treat their mom with respect, I don't just turn the TV volume up so I can ignore their behavior. If my kids are disrespecting their mom or back-talking their mom, I love them. We're going to fix some things. We're going to have a little talk. We're going to redirect some behaviors. 
I can love my kids unconditionally, but I don't have to accept the way that they behave. I can love my kids unconditionally, but don't tolerate their disrespectful behavior. I can love them and still correct them when necessary. I can love them and still discipline them when necessary, which means as Christians, we need to understand we can love people and still disagree with them. Just because we don't see eye to eye or don't align doesn't mean we forfeit the call of Christ to love people the way he loves people. And I will ring this bell until I've got no more breath left in my lungs. We need to be a people who are willing to have other people in our lives who tell us what we need to hear, not just what we want to hear. But we have a whole world full of people who only want to hear the things that they want to hear. So our responsibility is to speak the truth in love with grace. In love with grace. So many Christians, they just want to be yelling the truth at people, but we don't present it with love and grace. In order to be able to share truth with people, we need to first establish a level of trust. And so many times, we just want to tell people what we see wrong in them without working first to establish a level of trust to where the conversation actually has something to take root of. I need people in my life, and I would encourage you to have people in your life to tell you what you need to hear, not what you, just what you want to hear. In fact, I would argue this, that as Christians, if we really believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father, it's the only way to eternity in heaven, if we really believe that, then not telling people the truth might be the most hateful thing that we could do. But it has to be done in the context of love and grace. Because we have a world that so desperately hungers for love, they'll settle for whatever makes me feel good in the moment because it feels like a version of love. So I would offer this, if if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, I would offer this, that we are called to this response, to respond to the gift of God's grace, to love our God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, and to love Every person we come in contact with the same way in the same heart that Jesus loves me. And if that's you, then I would say you need to be confident in two things to get started. The first thing is confident in who you are, and the second is confident in whose you are. Who you are, I am a follower of Christ. I've surrendered my heart to Jesus. My response to the lavishing love of our Father is that I surrender my life to follow after him. And whose I am, I am a child of God. And if I could be honest, if we could just settle on those two truths, I think everything else would make loving other people a whole lot easier. If I could settle in my heart, confident in knowing that I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm not trying to live my life to get as close to the line of sin without crossing it and get out of God's favor. No, I'm pursuing Christ, giving my life and surrender to him. I am a follower of Jesus and I am a child of God. And to be honest, honest, any other label we add, it doesn't really matter. Because honestly, I believe every time we add a label to someone, we put limitations on our capacity to love them. And we live in a world who's all about the label. And every time we label someone, we've limited our capacity to love them. This is my neighbor, Brandon, right here. Brandon lives a couple doors down from me. He's my neighbor, so he's close. We're good friends. Brandon is welcome to come over anytime he wants, knock on the door, and borrow some ketchup. Brandon is not allowed to just walk right in and get the ketchup out of the fridge. We're not on that level because he's my neighbor. This is my coworker, Bill, over here. Bill's my coworker. Bill is, he's a nice guy. We exchange pleasantries every single day, but that's as far as our relationship goes. I will extend no more trust to Bill because he is just my coworker. This is my wife over here. My wife has free access to the kitchen anytime she wants, free access to the fridge anytime she wants. She's giving me the stare down right now. I should probably go a different direction. My wife is free to walk into any room she wants at any given time because I love her on a different level. And in our world, that's how we operate, right? We we put labels on people to define the restrictions of how we love them. And and I would offer this, this truth, and we'll unpack it a little bit more. If you find yourself struggling to love somebody the way that Jesus loves you, maybe the first thing you need to do is remove the labels from them. Because if I just see them as child of God, I I can get stuck on a lot of behavior. I can get stuck on a lot of attitude. But if I just see them as child of God, who God loves every bit as much as he loves me, that changes my interaction with them. Every time I put a label on somebody, it characterizes them. It modifies the noun. So labels are just basically adjectives that that modify the noun. It modifies how, how we see. So every time I put a label on someone, it determines the level of access I have. It determines, if I'm being honest, it quantifies them. I only trust them this much. And in most cases, it establishes boundaries of how I really and truly love them. So these labels, they modify fundamentally the the identity of the noun. It changes how I view the person. I'll give you a quick example. Mother's Day is coming up. Um, Dads and kids, here's your warning. Mother's Day is coming up. Get prepared. Um, Mother's Day is coming, and with Mother's Day, like, we all have a definition of mom. But if I were to put a label in front of the word mom, like 
Um, maybe you're a stay-at-home mom. That changes the, the identity or the definition of mom. If I was to say, like, you're a young mom, oh, girl, those, we, we change the context by adding the word young. We put a different label on it. If I was to say single mom, it gives you a different context and context of what we define mom. Every time we add a label to someone, it changes our capacity to see them as child of God. For me personally, every time I've found myself struggling to love someone the way Jesus loves me, I've, I've really learned to how to remove the label that limits me as seeing them from a child of God, that limits me from having compassion on them with, as though Jesus saw people as sheep without a shepherd. And on the other side of this, I, I would offer this. If you're somebody who demands to call me this, if you're somebody who demands that people put a label in place ahead of whatever, I'll, I'll give you a real churchy example. Um, oftentimes, Christian folks will put their denomination in front of Christian, whether it's Catholic or Lutheran or Baptist or whatever denomination, will add a label that really redefines follower of Christ. It adds context to it. It adds some other meaning to it. It puts some limitations or some boundaries in place that really kind of corrupt the purity and the simplicity of follower of Jesus. And the more labels I add to someone, really I'm modifying the now and I'm modifying the identity. I'm changing it over time to make it really more difficult. And if you're a person that demands someone puts a label in there for you, I, I would encourage you, you're making it more difficult for people to fully love you like Jesus loves them. I'll give you an example for, I did some math this week and it's kind of depressing. I've been a pastor for 20 years, guys. I'm old. I didn't realize how old I was. That's, that's a long time. And, and, and. I'll be honest, in 20 years of being a pastor, I've never tried to demand someone calls me pastor. Now, you might be like, well, that's why. Well, because contextually, like, there's people that have a lot of church hurt, and they may have some specific church hurt with a pastor, and that name label pastor may cause them to feel a certain way that really isn't right or fair or just. So I, I just, I, I'm Luke. I'm, I'm Luke, and God happened to call me to put me in a position where I get to love on people and point people back to Jesus. But you know, one of the most rewarding parts, one of the most humbling parts of my job is when I sit down with a family in their living room who've just lost a loved one. And someone comes in and has an appointment and sits in my office and we talk about a major life decision they're trying to make. When someone's life has fallen apart and they've been tragically injured or hurt or wounded by someone and they're trying to walk through the steps of forgiveness, that's the times where I don't have to say, call me pastor. They just do. It's such a wonderful part of my job to sit in people, sit with people in, in, in the life that they're going through, the things that they're walking through, and realize, like, I'm not telling you what to call me, but because you've, you've turned the corner, maybe you've, now you see me in a different light, or you've put a different trust in God working through me to help you, it changes the way we see people. My prayer as your pastor will always be that you come to love Jesus more. My prayer for this church will always be that you come to love Jesus more and take steps with him. My hope is that as you come to know Jesus more and love him more, that our response is to do greater and greater at loving people the same way that Jesus loves us. Can I just offer that my goal will never be to get you to love Crossroads. My goal will never be to get you to love me or my preaching. My, my goal would never be to get you to love something about somebody on our staff or a gathering of people, but to love Jesus first. Because what often happens is people will love the church, they'll love their group, they'll love their class, they'll love the preacher and then what happens when something changes? What happens when your job has you move away? What happens when the dynamic of the relationship changes? What happens when somebody can't preach the way they used to anymore? All of a sudden, we see so many people that don't just walk away from the church, but they walk away from their faith because it's what I loved most. My prayer, my hope is that you just love Jesus so much, you can love him wherever you go, wherever God plants you. My hope is that we love Jesus so much out of his great love for us that our response is to love him with all that we have and love other people. My prayer really is that the more you get plugged into crossroads, that becomes evident in all we are, that we have a great love for our God with our heart, with our soul, with our mind, and that we have a great love for every person that God brings through our path to love them the way Jesus loves me. And as we're unpacking this series on loving like Jesus, I, I wanna give you three thoughts today. These are not an exhaustive list. This is not, I scoured through all the scriptures and I came up with three things. These are just three things that are really profound. I would even call them pillars of ways that Jesus reveals his love for us, to us, that we might love like Jesus. If we're taking notes, number one, he sat with people. Jesus, as busy as he was, teaching to thousands and tens of thousands of people at a time, going on tours of healing and ministering to people, as busy as Jesus was, he always found time to sit with people. Because I believe that sitting with people, or maybe better said, loving people, means carving out time for them. As fast-paced as the world as we live in, as, as fast as things have to get done, as, as much as there is to try to capture our attention, Jesus always made it a point to stop and to sit with people. John chapter four, if you know the story, Jesus sits down at a well and talks to a Samaritan woman. 
And he could have jumped right in. In his knowledge and his authority, he could have jumped right in and condemned her. Listen, woman, you got problems. You've been married numerous times, and you're living with a guy now who's not even your husband. But you know what he did first? He sat down. He got down on her level. That didn't dismiss him from being able to share the truth, to be able to speak the truth in love and grace. But the first thing he did was get down to eyeball, eyeball level with her and share with her, God's got better in store for you. You're missing the mark of what God has put you on this planet for. And let me tell you the truth that will set you free from that. Luke chapter 19, if you know the story, Jesus had arrived in Jericho and he's walking through town and he comes to cross paths with a guy named Zacchaeus. Now, if you grew up in church, you might not have known this, but you actually had a label for Zacchaeus if you were a little kiddo in church talking about Zacchaeus, right? He was a little vertically challenged fella. We sang songs about his label and we confined our ability to love him because of how we saw him. Jesus comes across Zacchaeus and he speaks directly to him, Luke chapter 19 and verse five. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Can I just offer what I think might be one of the bigger hurdles for Christian folks? is that we see stories like that in the scripture and we skim right over them because we see people that aren't like us or don't fit into our realm of the world as an inconvenience. And maybe, just maybe, instead of seeing people as an inconvenience, we see them as divine appointments where God has brought us in to sit with someone who needs to feel the love of Jesus today. Maybe when you go out to eat for day for lunch and there's a long line waiting to get in, maybe God didn't put you there that you would actually rest a little bit and check your Facebook updates. Maybe the reason God put you in that long line is because someone sitting next to you in that line needed to feel the love and encouragement of Jesus today. Maybe all those times you get stuck at your kid's game when they're not even in the game, but you're a good parent, so you gotta sit on that bleacher and wear your, never mind. You're sitting there watching the game. Maybe the reason God brought you to the game to where your kid wasn't playing so you didn't really have to pay attention is so that you could share some love with the person you sit on the bleachers with. Maybe every one of those moments where we think people are an inconvenience is really God's way of saying that I need you to share the love Jesus sat down with people who really didn't know him, but Jesus also sat down with people who knew him well. Acts chapter two and verse verse 42. First generation, first century of church, Christian folks getting together. This is what they did. Acts chapter two and verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer. Verse 46. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared in meals with great joy and generosity. Can I just offer that maybe there's something more spiritual than to getting together for food than we give credit to. I mean, so often we read where Jesus sat down with people and they dined together, they ate together, they, they enjoyed each other's company while eating together. I would just encourage you as the weather starts to get nicer, who are the people in your neighborhood? Who are the people that you intersect with that maybe God has put on your heart to invite them over for a meal where you could just sit and spend time with this is what I believe. When Jesus would show up and sit, sit down with people, it was more than that. It's in your notes. Sitting with people means showing up for people. You ever like sign up for one of those raffles where they're like, hey, we're going to give away a new car this Saturday. And then you get to the fine print and it says what? Must be present to win. Christian folks ought to lead the world in must be present. But we ought to lead the world in showing up for other people. But we ought to be so in tune to the Holy Spirit that when God prompts our heart, they're having a rough time. They're making a life decision. They've got to make some really hard decisions in life. We just show up. Why? Because I felt God's presence. I felt the Holy Spirit say, hey, just go sit down with them. Just go show up and see what's going on. Why? Because Jesus modeled it time and time again. When someone needed counseling, Jesus showed up. And when someone needed healing, Jesus showed up. And when someone needed guidance, Jesus showed up. And when someone needed direction or redirection, Jesus showed up. And when we needed saving, Jesus showed up. And let me just maybe address some of us in the room. When Jesus showed up, it wasn't always to talk at people. There were significant times where Jesus would stand on the side of a mountain, stand in a boat and talk to people in a presentation sort of way. But there were often times, in fact, more recorded times where Jesus would show up and he would just listen. Where he would wait for opportunities for someone to gain trust that they would hear what he had to say. Did you know in the gospels over 300 times, Jesus asked questions? Did you know not one time did Jesus ask questions because he was trying to gather information? He's Jesus, he knew the answers but he asked questions in order to get them to speak because the people who are so desperate to find love and to feel loved, sometimes someone who will listen to me feels just like being loved and I can't tell the difference. Jesus would ask questions to get people to talk. And when people would talk, they would open up. And when they would open up, they would build a level of trust that Jesus could share truth with them in a way that changed everything. Far too often, I see Christian folks Busyness excuse to the side. Maybe the second most used excuse of why we don't sit and show up for people is we just don't know what we would say. 
Pastor, I don't know what to tell them. I'm not trained in the scriptures. I'm not somebody who's gone to seminary. I'm not somebody who can sit down and say all these things. Good news. None of us are trained well enough to do that. But God has this incredible promise where he says, once you follow Jesus, he will send his Holy Spirit to live in you. And one of the most incredible gifts of the Holy Spirit is when I don't have the words to say, he does. And if I'm in obedience, going to sit down when Jesus prompts me to go and to sit, to go and to show up. And if I listen to what he has to say, he will always give me the right words to ask. He'll always give me the right things to encourage. He'll always give me the right things to say. Maybe I'll pose the question like this. Where have we robbed God from an opportunity to share his love with somebody because we were too insecure to sit down? Maybe God is not calling you to put together a sermon. It's fun, let me tell you. Maybe, maybe God is not calling you to be a preacher on stage. Maybe God is calling you to be a minister in your home, to be a minister at your place of work, to be a minister at your kid's game. And to simply listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, to sit down next to someone, to show up for someone and allow him to give you the words to ask questions. Allow him to give you the words to offer encouragement. Allow him to remind you of the scriptures and how we can share God's love with grace and truth to everyone we cross paths with. How many times have we robbed God of an opportunity to share his love through us because we were just too insecure to just sit down? Christians, we must be present to win. He sat with people. Number two, he served people. Jesus was an expert at showing us how to serve people. John chapter 13, we've talked about it several times in the last couple of weeks. John 13, Jesus sits with his disciples for this last supper, for this Passover meal. And as they sit together, he's unpacking truths. He's revealing the last of the things he wants to tell. He's showing them so many things, but he doesn't just stop with his words. Love is not just verbal, it's also visible. John chapter 13, starting in verse 40. So he gets up. So Jesus is sitting with his disciples and he, he gets up. He gets up from the table. He takes off his robe and he wraps a towel around his waist. He poured water into a basin and he began to wash the feet of his disciples, drying them with the towel he had around him. Now, full context, this wasn't an uncommon practice. Um, this was an act of hospitality that was common in Jewish culture. Um, last week, you remember last week when it was still winter? If you would have came over to the Smith's house last week, you probably would have worn a jacket or a coat. And a good hospitality would have been, when you come into our house, let me take your coat. So you don't have to wear it around the whole time you're at our house. You're not have to carry it around with you, lug it around. We would take your coat and put it somewhere safe that the dog wouldn't tear it up. And then we would give it back to you when, when you left. It's hospitality. It's a practice in our culture. <clears throat> in, in Jesus' time, this was often the practice that when people would arrive at someone's house, we've got dirt roads and dirt paths and dirt sidewalks, and they showed up with their open-toed sandals. Or if they didn't have any shoes, they couldn't afford shoes, they came barefoot. Rather than track that dirt and dust all over the home, the owner of the house, the, the leader of the house, would often send a servant to wash the feet of the guests. So John chapter 13 and verse 14. <clears throat> so, so Jesus says to his disciples, now he's washed his feet. He says, and since I, your Lord and teacher. See, the practice being that it was the servant's responsibility in the home to wash the feet. But Jesus says, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You ought to wash the feet of others. You ought to wash others' feet. I have given you an example to follow. Now do as I have done. Jesus wasn't just saying, hey, let's practice hospitality a little bit more. Let's, let's take our hospitality up in this new covenant to a new level. What he was really doing was, was reinforcing and reminding and even validating the same thing he had taught all throughout his ministry. Things like Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26. Jesus says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Verse 28, he says, the son, the son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This, this wasn't just a, a command to married people. Husbands, if you want to have a good wedding, then serve your wife. If you want to have a good marriage, then serve your wife. L listen, that's great advice. If you want to see your, your marriage strengthen, your family strengthen, then practice the discipline of serving even when you don't feel like it. This was a far greater instruction than that. It was a, a far bigger behavior, a far better attitude than that. Make it a practice to go and serve. Like, we are experts at the one-time serving opportunities, right? We are experts at the, hey, I'm going to go and show up one time. My friend asked me to move, so I'm going to go this one time, and I'm going to help him pack the U-Haul. I'm going to help him move. Can I just offer that, that sometimes those one-time acts of service do more to puff up our pride than they do to adjust our heart and point it to become more like Jesus? Like, have you ever noticed, like, when people serve one time, it, it's real easy to start to kind of puff up, like, look at me, I showed up, I, I dedicated some time today, I gave up mowing my yard that I could help you move, and if you don't believe me, just go check out Instagram and Facebook, because it looks like this. Look what we did today, move 52 boxes, hashtag blessed and helping the Lord. 
Like, like we brag about it. One time moves often help us just to build our own pride. But have you ever noticed that people that serve consistently, they don't brag about it. It's not because they think less of it. It's not because they, don't, they aren't excited about it. It's not because they really find fulfillment and joy in doing so. But people that serve consistently have found that it's not about me getting attention. It's more about developing an attitude of Christ. It's in your notes. Serving is not just something that Jesus did. A servant is who he is. That's the mindset that he lived his life with. It's the example he set for us. And if I'm going to love people like Jesus, it's not just serve this one time, check the box, and call it good. It's becoming a servant and who I am. Have you ever noticed that love is a perishable commodity? Like if you're married, yesterday's love is not going to get you very far today. I think for me, like the eclipse was this week. It was kind of neat. I heard a lot about it. I remember an eclipse from back like fourth or fifth grade. I remember some of the things that were going to happen, but I think the one thing that I forgot or maybe overlooked or just didn't expect was how cold it got. Like as the moon started to really block out part of the sun, I was amazed at how quickly the temperature dropped. And for me, like it was a really good reminder that that the sun, the the heat from the sun of yesterday is not going to warm our side of the planet today. That the sun rays, that the light rays from yesterday aren't going to illuminate us today. That every day the sun comes around and has to warm us up. Every day the sun comes around and has to shine light on us. Listen, if you're married, you can't rest your future on yesterday's love. Oh, woman, I told you when I married you, I loved you. How many more times must I do it? Yeah, see how far that goes and how comfortable the couch is. If we're not continuing every day to pour out more love, to to serve and to sit with our spouse, it's going to get cold. Real, real quick. Serving is not what I do. Servant is who I am. Jesus says, love each other just as I have loved you. Jesus didn't just come to serve, but he was a servant at his core. And he served people. And he loved people by sitting with them, by showing up for them. He served people by by making it a practice to do the unexpected thing, to put himself in a place of a humble servant. Now, I'll, I'll be honest, like, Sometimes God gives us these things that we can really just walk out on our own. Like if you, if you were to put in practice the discipline of just prioritizing time, making time, carving out time to go and sit with someone, if you put into practice the, the art of looking around and recognizing when someone's grieving, someone's hurting, someone's uh, frustrated or uncomfortable, and just put it in practice to go and sit with them, you, you could really kind of even on your own increase your capacity. I mean, there's incredible layers that the Holy Spirit would add to, but if we just practice some of the disciplines of the scriptures, it would just make life better for so many people. I mean, we could really just get in the habit, get in the practice, get in the regular routine of serving people. I mean, it's a good thing. There's lots of good humanitarian organizations out there. There's lots of ways people have demonstrated the benefit of serving. Now, again, we can understand there's layers that only the Holy Spirit can provide for us, get us to. But this, this next one, this next one, you can never just muster up a little bit of courage and get better at. This next one, you can never just try a little bit harder and, and maybe make a better effort at it. This one is going to have to require more than just my efforts to really even scratch the surface of what this does to make us and help us love more like Jesus. Jesus sits with people, he serves people, and number three, he forgives people. We can't just under our own power forgive people that have deeply wounded us. We can try, but we'll still carry it. I can't just put a little bit more effort in and find a whole new level of the freedom and the breakthrough that comes with Christ-like forgiveness. And if I'm being real honest with you, like I've had way too many conversations with people in the context of this passage that I'm about to read, who just simply can't allow themselves to get past the feeling, the conflict that exists in them. And because of that, they can't fully experience the love of God because they won't or they can't in their own mind, in their own heart, justify allowing someone to be forgiven of how they were hurt so deeply. Matthew chapter six, verse 14. Starts out beautifully. Verse 14, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. Man, that's so amazing. So powerful, so incredible. Jesus wasn't done. Verse 15, but if you refuse to give others, your father will not forgive your sins. This is a completely different perspective, a completely different angle on what it looks like to love like Jesus. Forgiving someone, I like to define, forgiving someone is releasing someone of the debt that I believe they owe me for an offense they have toward me. When you do something against me, I create a debt. I create, a, a, you owe me this in order for me to forgive you. If, you. if you harm me or someone I love, if you bring pain to me or someone I love, then, then I put together a little payback sheet of this is what you need to do, this is what you need to say, this is how long you need to grieve, 
And then I will consider releasing you of the debt that I've determined you owe me for the hurt you caused against me. Colossians chapter two and verse 13 says, God made us alive together with Christ. We've been having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of our debt that stood against us. And he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Do you see why God is so distinct in saying, if you forgive and you follow Christ, I'll forgive you. But if you follow Christ and you don't forgive, you're cut off. But do you see why there's such a, 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 big, a big dividing wall here between why God says, listen, if you're not, then I can't, then I won't. Jesus paid the ransom for me. Jesus paid with his life the debt that I owe. And if I'm not willing to forgive someone of what I believe they owe me, then I'm forfeiting what Jesus did for me. We have this discussion in our house all the time. We try to set an expectation. If you don't clean your room before bed tonight, you will not have your cell phone tomorrow. Now, listen, I'm a reasonable parent. This is not 1029 and bedtime at 1030. This is like, hey, when you get home from school, you've got a big chunk of time. And if your room is not clean before you go to bed, you will not have your phone tomorrow. And then sometimes I even go as far as to explain. So tomorrow, if you don't have your cell phone, is it because I was a mean dad? No, no, no. It's because you chose to not fulfill the thing that was required of you in order to retain your phone tomorrow. You should see how many times a wife has to say this stuff to me, though. It's crazy. <laughs> listen, it's the same concept. God says, listen, if you follow Jesus, if you've surrendered your life to follow Jesus, you're a follower of Christ then I've extended forgiveness to you. But if you choose not to forgive someone who's offended you, you're willingly giving back the forgiveness that I've extended to you. You're willingly giving back the grace. You, you may not think you're willing in doing it, but if you can't get to a place where through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can reconcile, we can forgive the debt. Well, forgiveness doesn't mean I restore the relationship to where it was before the hurt. It simply means I release you of the debt of what I believe you owe me for the pain you caused me. And God's saying, listen, if you, if you can't forgive someone, then you're forcing the discipline that comes with it. You're giving the forgiveness that I offered you back. You've lost the gift. And I know this is a way bigger conversation than today. And I know this is a way bigger deal. So can I just offer this? If you're someone who's got someone that you really struggle to forgive, then maybe start out. Jesus gives us a couple, I think, really practical steps to soften our heart, to, heart to allow the forgiveness to take place. If you're taking notes, letter A, someone's hurt you, pray for those who hurt you. Now, I do not mean, please hear me, please, please make sure you're listening to this. This does not mean country music prayers. I pray their brakes go out while they're driving down a hill. Up. No, we're not praying for people's tires to go flat. We're not praying for their dog to get run over. We're not praying for them to lose their job. Like, not those kind of prayers. And I'll just offer, we'll dig deeper into this next week. But Luke chapter 6 and verse 28, Jesus says, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who hurt you. If you're struggling to forgive someone, start there. Pray for someone who's hurt you. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. Jesus says, you've heard that the law, the law of Moses, the law of the old covenant, you've heard that the law says, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But now we're in a new covenant. But now we're under new leadership. But now we have a new agreement between God and his people. Jesus says, but I say, love your enemies and pray for those who per persecute you. Now, I, I realize that's asking a lot. And I know forgiveness of someone who's really hurt you or someone you love is asking a lot. So if I could just offer this first step, pray for them. Pray for them. And I'll even put a disclaimer in there. Pray for them and don't anticipate that that'll instantly change anything about them. Because it might not. But I promise if you pray for them, it'll start to change some things in you. And through humility, when God starts to change things in us, it changes our perspective. And it changes our heart. And it changes our capacity to forgive. Praying for others often helps me to change the way I see people. Praying for others often allows the capacity and the space and the door to open that God can start to release me of the, the hate or the anger that I've been carrying towards that person. Praying for them allows God to start undoing the anger that I've allowed to build up and harden up in my heart. Praying for other people gives, do, gives God that the access to be able to, to help move me past the hurts of my past that I've been carrying for so long. And when we pray for other people, it gives God a wide open door to start to heal the brokenness in our own heart. Pray for those who hurt you. And the second one, letter B, I think it's pretty simple. Keep reminding yourselves of how God has forgiven me. 
keep reminding ourselves, because why? It's really hard to harbor unforgiveness when I'm reminding myself of all the times God's had to forgive me. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13 <clears throat> it reads this, it says, make an allowance for each other's faults. Forgive any, anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. But pastor, you don't understand how mean they've been to me. Well, you know how many times I've been mean to God? And when I ask, he's still willing to forgive me. Well, pastor, they weren't there for me when I needed the most. They turned their back on me. I don't think I can make enough paper in the world to list off the times I've turned my back on God. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. I don't want to say that. And yet every time I've come back and said, God, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? He forgives me. Well, pastor, you don't know the pain that they've caused. They lied to me. They lied about me. Can I, can I just offer how many times have we been dishonest with God and think that he's not going to know or be partially truthful with God? I mean, I was 99% true with God. Can I just offer this? A 99% truth is still a 100% lie. And how many times have I been dishonest or misleading to God thinking he wasn't gonna know? And yet God, so good in his love and grace, still willing to forgive every single time. Pastor, this is tough. Yeah, I know. But Jesus has more in store for you than holding on to this hurt. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the person who offended me to die. Jesus has got more in store for us than that. Galatians chapter five. Paul really kind of sums it all up here. Still on this same thought, still tying this whole conversation back to people in the first generation, first century of church that were trying to convince people to go back and relive through the laws in order that Christ would accept them. And Paul's like, stop doing that. Galatians chapter five, starting in verse one, he says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up to in slavery to the law again. Verse two, listen, I, Paul, I tell you this, if you are counting on circumcision to make it right, to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit for you. I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation of the whole law of Moses. If you're going to require people to do one piece of it, you're going to have to adhere to all of it. If you're going to try to incorporate that hybrid of old covenant and new covenant, old law and new law, you're going to make this blend together. You're doing a disservice to both. If you're trying to cause people to go through this first, you're missing the entirety of the point that Jesus shares. Instead, Paul says this in verse four. If you're trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off from Christ. You've fallen away from God's grace. Verse five. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness that God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit of being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important, if you're a note taker in your Bible, if you've got a written paper here and you want to highlight, circle, underline, draw arrows too, this is what is important. is faith expressing itself in love. Love is the common theme that ties all of the scriptures together. The love that our God has for each of us is the common thread that ties all of God's enormous plan of redemption for all of mankind together. When love is misunderstood, we direct our love into places that can never satisfy. When love is misguided, we search for love in places that will never provide the fulfillment of love. But when love is understood, I'm a follower of Jesus and a child of God. We remove the power that sin has in our life. But listen, the reason people have power overtaken by sin is because we love sin. I don't know how to say that any more simple. We love the feeling that comes along with, with fulfilling a sin. We love the fix that it provides. We love the temporary satisfaction that sin offers. The reason sin has power in our lives is because people love sin. But can I just offer, this isn't as harsh as you think. This is actually really good news because to overcome this, this sin, to overcome this problem with our love of sin is, is a greater love. And our God offers the greatest love. He is love. And the love of our father is what overcomes the power that sin has over any of us. Faith expressing itself in love. Let me pray with you. God, I thank you for today. 
And I thank you for this great love that you've given us. And I thank you that this love is unfailing, is never ending, and sees past all my mistakes. God, I thank you for the goodness of who you are. Thank you for this incredible gift of Jesus, his life in exchange for mine to pay the debt that I owed, that I might know you and know your love. So God, let that be our response of our heart, to love you back with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and to love every person we cross paths with, just as Jesus loves me. I thank you for that gift. I thank you for that promise. And I thank you for every person you cross my path. In Jesus' name.